Welcome to Micro Lectures by Living on the Red Planet. This is the third lecture in the Crater series, and our seed question for today is how can impact craters and their associated formations help future human habitation of Mars? So in the past two lectures, we talked about why there's so many craters on Mars and some of the differences between Earth and Mars and the other terrestrial planets in why we see more craters on some of them than others. And then we moved into talking about where do the impactors come from and what affects the formation and what types of craters, specifically we were looking at simple and complex craters, exist. So in this lecture, we finally get to the burning question, which is, why does it even matter for humans living on Mars? Now, I have three general answers for you, and by no means are these the only answers. It's certainly not limited to these. So basically, that's energy, resources, and habitat. So we'll jump right into energy, and this really is the collection of solar energy in some way or another. So if you use the slope of a crater, which is sun-facing, now in the northern hemisphere that's going to be the south, and in the southern that's going to be the north, that's an excellent location to place your solar arrays. So say you're using photovoltaic to power your habitat, your community where you're living on Mars. You need power in some way. And that can be a superb location to put it, especially if you're using concentrated solar. Um, if you're powering, instead of using solar panels, if you're using the sun's heat to heat up some sort of liquid, this is usually going to be a, an oil or something like that, to then run your turbine or your motor and produce electricity that way instead of using your solar panels to do that, to produce it chemically, then that can be an excellent location for it. Furthermore, it's a good place for reflectors. I'm just talking about reflecting the light. So why would we want to do that? A big reason would be that we're going to need to grow plants. We depend on plants for a lot of things, and we'll get into that more in the next series about life support systems. But we have a lot of plants which Many of them are going to do fine in the amount of light that Mars has. Now, Mars gets less light from the sun because it's further away. It's about, on average, 1.5 astronomical units. Now, an astronomical unit is just a unit that we have created to help us describe distances within the solar system. And it is the average distance between the Earth and the sun. When we're in the inner solar system, we usually talk, we'll use kilometers or AUs, astronomical units. And as soon as we start to get out of the solar system itself, at that point, we start talking about, you know, the further out we get, we start talking in terms of light minutes, and then further out light years. But close in, we can just think about Mars is typically about half again as far from the sun as we are. So it's getting less light. Now, as I was saying, a lot of plants are going to do fine with that, especially if we select plants that on Earth come from some of the more cloudy regions that are adapted to be understory plants and whatnot. But if we're using reflectors, mirrors, things like this, it doesn't even have to actually be a mirror, though. It could simply be some sort of reflective, shiny surface. Anybody who has stood next to a wall painted white in the summer can tell you it doesn't have to be a mirror to be bright. We can place those reflectors in basically the, the walls of the crater and reflect them towards our greenhouses or even our habitats where it might be beneficial for humans or um, other non-plant living organisms in addition to have that extra light. So our next category is resources. Remember last lecture, we talked about impact melts and the fracturing. When the impactor hits at great enough speeds, it can actually cause the rock to melt and become new rock, right? If, it, if the speed is great enough, then we get enough pressure traveling through and we get the shock wave, which melts it. 
depending on what material was impacted and how quickly that was traveling, so thus the, the pressure, we're going to get different results. Now, one of them is that we can get these glassy materials, and those can have multiple different uses for industry. The next is that when the impact occurs, there's an excavation that happens. So we're revealing material that was below. Now, if this was an impact with a lot of velocity, we're probably going to find that there was some sort of impact melt and the structure of the material is going to be changed. But if it's one of our simple craters, if it was a fairly slow or l low energy impact, then we may be able to get to some of the minerals which are below that simply the it's making it a little bit easy for us to get to these resources and to mine them. Now the last one I'm going to mention here, because I don't want to be going on and giving you list after list of things, but that is really interesting, is depending on the lati where you are, the latitudes on the globe of Mars, we have evidence or photos which suggest that there may in fact be craters that are filled with ice. Now some of this ice may be CO2, but there's a good chance that quite a bit of it is actually water ice. Water is going to be super important for us. It is here on Earth, and on Mars, it's going to be even more so because of the scarcity. We know that Mars probably has quite a bit of water in its soil, in its atmosphere, and there's different ways for us to access that. We even believe that there are probably aquifers. But if you have ice sitting right there on the surface or right below a very thin, shallow uh, layer of dust and covering, then that can save a lot of time and a lot of energy. And energy is something that one really needs to use wisely in a situation like Martian colonization. Which brings us to the next and I think the most exciting of the three categories, and that is habitat. Human habitat and habitat for the ecosystems that support us. So we haven't really spent a lot of time on this yet, but it is the central and main focus of this entire website and the, this, these micro lectures that are being done as part of the website, uh, livingontheredplanet.com. So we need to have some place to put humans and the ecosystems that support us. And there are certain conditions that we evolved with that need to be met. Now, Mars and Earth are very, very, very similar in many ways, but there are some areas where the conditions are different. And here are the biggies. Again, not limited to, but the real bigs. We need a different composition of air than is present on Mars. So we need much more oxygen that's there. We also need it to be much thicker. So the pressure is not the right pressure for us. It's way too low and we need far more pressure. So we have to be inside some sort of constructed environment, whether that is a suit or um, a rover or some sort of habitat, we need that pressure. Also, our bodies need particular temperatures. We have to maintain an internal temperature and we need an external temperature. And there's a pretty good range, but the surface of Mars, for the most part, there are exceptions, really isn't meeting that. So we need to create the correct temperatures for us to survive. Another one, and I'm almost hesitant to, to talk about this one, is the protection from radiation. Now, Yes, it is a real issue. There definitely is more exposure to radiation on Mars than on Earth because of the thickness of our atmosphere and the magnetosphere, which Mars has one, but not quite in the same way. And we can talk about that another time. But it is not as huge an issue as the media has been making it out to be recently. There's a lot of misleading information. So I'll leave it at there is radiation, but not the extent that 
we're often led to believe, and it's not that tricky for us to address. One of the ways that we address that is with our habitats, and we already know a lot about shielding, a lot about protection from radiation, and we'll be learning a lot more over the coming years. So in addition to all of that, we also just simply need somewhere to be, right? We just need location. We need somewhere to sleep, we need somewhere to work, you know, to to store things, to live, and we need somewhere to put the ecosystems that we will be part of and that will be supporting us. We need somewhere to grow our plants, to raise our fish and our animals for meat and whatnot. So all of that requires structure. So we need to build structures. And that's where the craters come in, and it's really exciting, because now, by no means are they the only option, but craters provide a great starting location for domes. And domes are one of the strategies among many, such as tents and dugouts and whatnot, where we might be able to live. So in our smaller, in our simple craters, many of these craters are going to be the size that it actually would be realistic for us to put a dome right over it. So there's our dome could be from some sort of glaze, or it could be from a Kevlar, materials like that. And if it's a tent-like material, then we can actually just pin it down around it. Now, if we want to use a full sphere or a squashed sphere, because we're dealing with a lot of material here, and you want to actually bury part of the sphere, then the crater has already excavated many thousands of tons of dirt. And that's going to be a really big task. So the, cre the craters create a starting point for us. That's when we're talking about our small, simple craters. When we move on to our more complex, our very large craters, we have some different options there. One of them is, remember we talked about how in some craters, especially the larger ones, we'll get this central uplift in the middle. That could be a location which we could dig into, build our structures and cover it, you know, seal it up, and then have some sort of reflection from the sides of the craters coming and pointing at it. Alternatively, we could simply be on the surface in the crater and have that same reflection occurring. The third and again, not the only, but the third that we'll be discussing today, is building into the cliff, into the face of the crater itself. So, of these larger craters, of course. And then you would, you would orient that very strategically. You would tend to want to be sun, facing the sun, um, whatever direction that is for your hemisphere, so that you could get that energy to produce electricity and for your plants and ecosystems. There's a lot more that we could cover, but I'm trying to keep these lectures short. So that's going to wrap up the third micro lecture in the Crater series. The next series is going to go into much more depth on some of what we started to touch on today, which are the conditions for life, specifically human life, that is, and how we're going to meet that on Mars. So we'll be talking about life support systems, and that will be a five-part series. So if you haven't already subscribed and you'd like to get them as soon as they come out, hit the subscribe button below. You can check out livingontheredplanet.com, contact me directly through livingontheredplanet at gmail.com, or check us out on Facebook. So until next time, keep on learning.